And believe it or not, right, the stools that they are sitting on are all made here at the kampong. Yeah, so all made here. Ah, okay. So if let's say you have any questions that you want to ask, you can ask uh, directly. Or if for those who are a bit more shy, right, you can SMS uh, to me at this number, right, nine three eight six two four nine two. Please don't share these uh, uh, <laughs> messages in other platforms. Okay, good. Okay, come. So let's uh, start the very first uh, question, right? Uh, anyone on the floor have any question? Feel free to ask. Ah, okay, come. Can you share your name and then uh, your question? Hi, Naomi. Hi, Naomi. So I will repeat Naomi's question, right? So, uh, are there any negative uh, implications of the the underwater communications on wildlife and animals? Yeah, definitely. Okay, I'm I'm right in front of the loudspeaker, so okay, that's better. Uh, yes, definitely. And uh, so the other thing that I kind of didn't really mention was that sonar is very similar technology, uh, and people have been doing research on effects of sonar uh, and different types of sonar on animals for many years. Uh, so usually, it's considered that lower frequency stuff is more harmful. Uh, very low frequency stuff, especially, has been proven to be harmful we generally use much higher frequencies and that's known not to actually have much impact on on wild animals so it's actually it's a, it's kind of like you know our human hearing you know there are some sounds that will make us queasy and uh, want to puke uh, there are some sounds that uh, and that, that's sometimes used in certain abatement methods or whatever but there are some sounds that you know we use to communicate so similarly there are some sounds that will make marine am animals un unhappy and we try to stay away from them thank you does that answer the question Okay, awesome. Any other question? Next question. Any question? Oh, okay, at the back. Do you have a question? Oh, no, no, no okay, you're, you're waving to me. Okay. So I have one question for the... Oh, there's one? Okay, awesome. Hey, what's your name? What's your name for? So I, I repeat the question. So this is from Mr. Wynn, am I right? The name? Yeah. And uh, he has a question about uh, does it, any of the panel know about the, the, the kind of the tidal uh, characteristics, the speed, the flow around Singapore, and uh, whether reclamation has any effect on that? And would anyone want to take the question? No? Okay, so maybe Dr. Newmedi want to give a try? Yeah. Um. I personally don't have any data, but I'm certain that like there are some departments or labs that have measured uh, hydrographic uh, parameters. With respect to how reclamation may have an impact on flow around some of these islands, um, I cannot be 100% sure, but given my experience with diving in some of the locations, we have also um, sort of corroborative evidence or at least um, suggestions from, from like divers who have been diving in Singapore for the past 20 years. So they basically dove in Singapore before some islands are reclaimed and also as well as after. So he, like one of my friends that I met on a dive trip actually mentioned that some of the um, flow conditions seem to have uh, slowed down a little bit, uh, especially in some of the um, when the islands are too close to each other, that's one of the examples that I have heard of. Uh, and in some instances, it could have also altered the direction of flow. Um, but that said, uh, these are all just sort of um, based on their diving experience uh, and not so much of um, having a actual data to support. 
Um, but I'm sure like there are some agencies or, or organizations that have measured this. For example, MPA, our Marine Port Authority, I'm very sure they have the data, but um, you know, it's a government agency, so yeah. <laughs> I'll leave it as that. Um, I'll add something here. Um, I don't know much about this directly, but there is a team in our uh, lab uh, headed by Professor Eric Adams, uh, who's looking at the same problem of reclamation of dropping uh, particles underwater and see how they behave with along with the flow we've had uh, we've heard from companies who do land reclamation we've had companies come to us and say that uh, whenever they do land reclamation uh, the water gets very murky quickly and then they have to send uh, probes down to sense it uh, and they have to stop operations and they want robots to take over and uh, but but i'm not sure about the details you can Um, I probably can't really answer of um, very well the yeah yeah okay <laughs> we will try but um, ju just just basically hearing from your solution basically suggestion um, and and just sort of going through in my head is that um, I think the other possible consequence that we might want to consider carefully unplugging um, this caveats is that um, given that it's already been stagnant for 20 years, we don't know what's underneath the seabed, we don't know what kind of horrible things or good things might be under that seabed, so that gesture could have more impact than then um, sort of alleviating some of the problems that are facing the fish farms along the east and west side of Johor Streets now. So I mean, this has just come out in my head. I mean, given that you know I've worked in the environment and and like we we really have a lot of sediments on the seafloor and they are very easily stirred up. So any gentle flow of water could potentially sort of uh, you know stir up something that you undesired. Because uh, over so many years, you don't know what's underneath that seabed. Uh, I mean, just giving an example is that diving off Pulau Semakau, it's when I have a pointer, um, I insert it down on the seabed, it goes straight down, and I don't see my pointer at all. So that's how soft some of the sediments can be. And, but that also reflects on the other perspective, which is that some types of these settled particles is very light. So any gentle movement of water could change that sort of dynamics of that environment. So my, I guess my kind of like sort of comment to that is that it can be good and bad, but that's it. It's something to try. Yeah. So it's like yeah. So basically, it's think about it. Yeah. 
just a random idea. You maybe get some of the robots, right? You send send down to open ROV, go and clean up the thing, and then after you clean up, uh, then you open up the culverts, right? Maybe it works. I don't know, right? Any next question on the floor? Okay, I've, I've, okay, I've, while you think of questions, I have one question for each speaker. Uh, is there a eureka moment in your life, right? Or throughout your research, like, aha, uh -huh, this is it. It's like I discovered something. Let's do something cool about it. Yeah, and and what was that moment, and how do you feel when you reach that uh, moment? Oh, me? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, I've always felt that it's always been a, a a slow but you know steady kind of learning. Uh, it's it's always been sort of you know hey I I, lear I learned something today and then you know five years later it comes back. So uh, the, what I work with today with, with in you know with underwater communication. Um, I did an internship back when I was an undergrad, uh, and I, this is what I work with. And you know, some of that com came back, and I, I feel that this is the cycle that I see more than eureka moments. Is is this resurgence of hey, I learned this and I learned this again, and I, I I realize that hey, if I apply this to that, maybe something cool can happen. So I'm seeing a lot more of that uh, cyclic behavior rather than a like a eureka. Like a eureka. Um, for me. Yeah, it wouldn't be one eureka moment. I think uh, every time I look at some natural phenomena, there is a eureka moment over there. Um, and it started off with, uh, I started off working on the stingray. And then, uh, yeah, when I studied, when I, when I saw that, uh, oh, it actually creates this kind of a wavy motion which lets it move so efficiently, that was one of them. And along the way, each of, each of the inspirations that I've taken uh, gives a eureka moment and a inspiration to develop something out of that. Um, for me, uh, with respect to this uh, ROV, the Eureka moment came was uh, when I realized that you don't need the kit to actually build it yourself. So that was really the Eureka moment because there was, a, I mean, they do have the kit online, but then I was telling myself, if I could be my all on my own, that was the Eureka moment for me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe when I first finished my like, not really finished, but like actually seeing the birth or the the sort of like the transformation of my first giant clam larvae to like <laughs> successfully. So I mean, just not to bore everybody, but like I basically spent an entire year and have multiple failures. I wasn't able to like breed this larvae. It was so difficult and there was there was very little help. Um, I had to rely on books and, and papers. And But what's really amazing was that every failed attempt, I see a new different stage of the larvae developing to the next stage. It's kind of like, you know, how you guys develop your ideas and, and building of robots as well. But for me, it was the idea of actually at the end of like one whole year, actually two years, and seeing my first year old giant clam was wow and and that basically sort of kept me going and it reminded me why I'm doing this research and why I didn't give up because I just kept trying and I wanted to see them you know go through the whole life cycle yeah wow thanks it reminds me of Dory you know just keep swimming just keep swimming okay so any more questions on the floor okay uh, ah, okay good come ask your question Now what's your name? Grace. Okay, so Grace has a very quick question. I repeat the question: What are the challenges or or false obstacles that or barriers that are preventing people from adopting you know, your solutions? Uh, for the two last uh, speakers. Um, in terms of bio-inspired technologies, they are uh, they are just starting to uh, evolve to a very uh, mature stage where we can you can actually put it in a field and test it. For example, the stingray we've been testing uh, we've been looking at the phenomena for the last five years, and we've just figured out exactly how it does it, and uh, we made a field deployable robot and tested it. So each of these. Uh, things takes a uh, long time in terms of research. For example, the sensors that I uh, mentioned, it, it took eight years to develop those micro sensors, which are exactly like a fish. 
Uh, because natural phenomena is really complex and um, you cannot think in terms of existing uh, parts or existing components that you have. You have to think out of the box to see how you can achieve that. So I think that is, yeah, um, but it, it's starting now. So I think hopefully from now it will be a, like a growth, exponential growth. So I think it's similar. Um, I think a lot of the fundamental con issues with like oh, understanding the fundamental issues with communicating underwater have have now been sort of understood. Uh, so now it's a it's a it's a entire. I mean, what what what's left to do is come up with innovative ideas to do networks, entire networks. So now we can have two nodes talking to each other. This is what we we do. Uh, but having an entire you know like a group of fifty people here having cell phones in the pocket talking to you know Facebook at the same time, that kind of jump needs to happen before people can actually really start using, and that needs a lot of innovative ideas in you know networking and communication. Uh, there's a li lot of research going on, uh, and I think that's that's where a lot of the cool stuff is happening. So, uh, I think a few years and a lot of uh, innovative ideas is what is is required. Okay, hold on. I'll, I'll go. I'll go on to the other other questions first, right? So a bit more time, then you add on, right? Uh, hoping that the rain stops. Uh, okay, so the this question from Amrula, which I think is a good lead on uh, lead up from the previous question, is like especially to Vignesh. Are there plans to up open source all the designs to your robots and perhaps onto the Open ROV platform? Um, yes, we plan to do that, but uh, it, not right now. Uh, so we want to uh, have the technology mature enough before people can start using it. Otherwise, it would be a waste to uh, put something not that doesn't work. So. Uh, Probably five years down the line, I think we can start seeing some of these bio-inspired technologies. For example, the micro sensors that I uh, that I mentioned, we have uh, spun off into a company and we are looking at where we can use these flow sensors, whether it's pipeline monitoring, medical flow monitoring, uh, airflow monitoring. So it's yeah, uh, over the next, I think, five years, we can start seeing some of these things out of the market. Uh, no. <laughs> Yeah. So, so yeah. So Hakim is like, I'm not gonna wait for five more years. I'm just gonna build it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is a question from one uh, between coastal conservation and protection against raising sea level. Uh, what could be some of the possible solution? Would anyone want to take that? Between coastal conservation and protection against raising sea level, what could be some of the possible solutions to solve? Any speaker wanna try? So for, for me, maybe I can share a bit uh, on a less te technological level. Uh, yes, I was at Silicon Valley, I mean, working on mobile payments and tech technology stuff. But the one that, uh, but the, the kind of the approach which I had for the kind of the team that was fighting for the shark sanctuary was actually a cultural one. Uh, it was about creating a shark sanctuary and, and, and the arguments that's being brought forward uh, at the governmental level are uh, basically about economic matters, right? So basically these are people who are sh hunting for sharks, right, to create shark fins. So there's a, a very strong economic argument. It could be a very good market or good uh, industry for the government to tap into. Uh, but me being the, the, the philosophical me, I, I look at the cultural aspects of why people even eat shark's fin, right? So it goes down to some of the quotes or, 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 or stories about it being an, like an elixir of life, you know, like something that brings, that boosts certain uh, things. But then when I, because I, I also do research in like Chinese philosophy, read Confucius and, and the other philosophers, most of them are more in sync with the idea of ha living in harmony with nature. Uh, and and if I'm not wrong, the those uh, stories about, about, about Eating shark fins is a it's it's a good thing. It's it's not really rooted in very strong, uh, grounded uh, f uh, philosophers' uh, words. So we kind of like shared some of these things, and of obviously the those economies will come out economic arguments, uh, and and I mean thankfully we somehow managed to get uh, the 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 first world's first shark sanctuary up. Yeah, so some of the solutions sometimes might not be. Uh, Technological, but maybe to the coastal conservation and protection against raising sea level, one of my dreams is to have floating cities. I'm not so sure if that would uh, solve it, right? But it's more like an adaptive measure since everything's gonna float, inspired by the kelongs that we live in. Uh, maybe someday we might be living in 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 in, in uh, on water, right? So, anyone want to give give a, a response to to that question, or we can move on to the next question? Okay, next question I have. 
for Dr. Neo. Hmm. You mentioned everyone can volunteer to help protect corals. What are some of the ways to start going about it, especially for a newbie? That's a great question. <laughs> and I mean, just to share how I started as well. So I mean, that's probably one way you can do it also. I think the very first thing is that you have that interest. And, and now in the last five years or so, I see a lot of people, not just... Um, not just scientists or just people, but there are people who are just really like ordinary people like you and I as well. Um, and they're, they're actually making the effort by just taking the first step out to visit some of our local seashores. Like there is this person that I really look up to and she's the one that brought me into this, which is Miss Riatan, who runs the Wow Singapore website. And the brochures that I brought today are made by her. Can you imagine? Like she, she has a normal day job and yet she actually invests so much of her time to actually do something that she's passionate about and which is to actually share her s the seashores with, with everyone as far as possible and as much as possible. And she has created a lot of websites and blogs that make it a lot easier for newbies or in fact anyone who's interested to actually look up for the kind of activities that you can participate. Uh, and some of the organizations I've mentioned as well, like the International Coastal Cleanup Singapore, ICCS. So they are actually in the midst of actually doing their, their runs now. They are actually starting to um, sort of engage volunteers for, for like coastal cleanup. Uh, and some of the others, if, if you're a diver, you can actually participate with Hantu Block. So I know, I know the founder herself as well, Debbie Ng, who started it. And she's also grown her database, sort of not database, but her, her human database of, of, of volunteers to actually help guide people to go diving in uh, local waters as well. Um, and to be honest, there's a lot of online resources now that you can find. And, and not just like maybe not probably joining some of these groups, but you as an individual can probably just make your way down. Um, some of the information like the tidal heights, low heights. So basically, sort of like backtracking a little bit, like all the photos you see are taken during low tide. So what low tide means is that the seawater actually recedes and what happens is that it exposes quite a big patch of the seashore. And some of these places that you can actually visit, and I, I do hear a lot of people actually visiting now, uh, like East Coast Park, um, Changi Beach. So along the whole stretch of Changi Beach is actually a really, really very nice seagrass meadow. So if you have a chance to go there, I think I would strongly encourage you to go there. It's one of my favorite places. Um, but there are other places, um, not just the east side, you know, wherever you stay, which is near the coastline, like Pongo. Um, these are places that you, you can have a look. Yeah, Sungai Bulo, Kranji, these are places that are well known, but sometimes every trip that you make there, you would see different things. That's why I always tell myself, I can go back to Changi Beach like 10 times and I've been there 10 times and I still see new things. I still see new animals that I've not seen before. And we actually still, with my friends, you know, we discover new things that we've, we, we never know as well about the different things. Yeah. So I mean, many, many, many people have different gifts, right? Uh, some people are better; they are very good at photography. They love photography, so they use photography uh, to raise awareness. Uh, and some of them, uh, like for example, scientists or even makers, right? They, I, I, I remember this video of a boy in the U.S. where he decided to do ocean cleanup and he created like a system, right? Uh, 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 like a primary school boy and. Basically, it also takes people who may maybe have funds, right? Then they can volunteer in a very different way. They can contribute in a different way. They help fund programs. I think each of you, what I've discovered throughout my years volunteering here and working here is that each of you has, has a gift and use that gift to advance whatever causes you have. And, and just out of curiosity, I want to know show of hands, right? I'm, I'm thinking of doing something like post-tech tarik. So I think I just call it Trek tarik lah for now. Huh? So we go uh, trekking or maybe we go to visit um, maybe Dr. Nyo Melin at her lab in St. John Islands. Oh, Christy, how many of you might be keen in such a thing? Ah, okay, okay. okay so stay tuned for the next Trek tarik. Okay, <laughs> okay so uh, maybe uh, anyone has any burning question before I go to my last question? Okay, come. What's your name? Uda, yeah, hi. Yes. Yes. Yep. 
so that's a very very good sh uh, question from Huda. So most of the engineers today speak about uh, exploration in terms of oceans. Oceans is a very vast thing. Right? I mean, I wish I can invite all the speakers I know who can uh, talk about uh, cleaning out the oceans. Actually, that's one of the speaker which uh, I've had I have in mind to bring, uh, but maybe in the future, uh, Tech Tariq. Uh, any of you have any uh, any uh, thoughts of any engineers or any technology people out there doing cleaning up in Singapore using technology? I'm not sure currently, but uh, for one of my the robots that we're doing, the turtle robot, the primary aim is to clean up oceans. We want many of these robots collaborating to clean oceans and be out there uh, uh, doing these tasks. Um, but I'm not sure who's doing it currently in this region. Mm, there's this particular so-called project, but it's not based in Singapore. But what happened was uh, I got to know this because, of um, course, I'm from uh, I work in Dyson. So Dyson annually we have this thing called the James Dyson Foundation. Essentially, it's a design competition whereby we um, welcome students from all over the world to come up with an idea. So uh, last year or two years ago, one student came up with a very fascinating idea. He called it the sea bin. So actually, right, is a it's a floating bin that actually just floats on the surface of the water of the ocean, and it's a siphon effect. So actually. It creates like a natural vacuum cleaner, so all the sea debris gets sucked in into this thing and can be easily collated. Yeah, so that's what I've recalled so far for ocean cleaning technologies. Yeah. On that line, I also remember another thing. There's a person looking at uh, these uh, vortices that uh, uh, Dr. Uh, May mentioned. Uh, there is this uh, gyres of uh, trash uh, going around in the oceans. There's like three large ones, and there's a uh, there's one uh, guy I think from Sweden who is looking at uh, having huge nets. Uh, uh, along these gyres, so that naturally the the trash comes to the nets and get trapped. So that's another uh, a large ocean cleaning uh, effort. Yeah. Yeah. So like uh, yeah. So the the, the person with, uh, who I have in mind, she actually used bio bio systems, right? Like using uh, some form of microorganisms to break down. Uh, like when there's an oil spill, which is a lot, yeah, getting it's getting more uh, apparent these days. Uh, using microorganisms and biology uh, to solve solution. Uh, maybe in the future, uh, tech tariq, uh, maybe ocean remediation or something, right? So I think my my last parting question would be to each speaker: If you were a marine animal, what would it be, and why? Okay. <laughs> okay, you, you can also include Pokemon names, right? If it helps, right? Okay. <laughs> well. Um Definitely a dolphin, uh, because I think uh, dolphins are something that have, that have uh, been studied a lot for their ability to communicate uh, and ability to communicate underwater, and it's it's something that uh, the lab, the lab, like the lab at NUS that I w uh, that we work collaborate with, uh, studied a lot to figure out how they communicate. And they do it really well, so I think that would be really fun. Also, you can jump out of water and you know make everybody around look at you. That's pretty cool. Um, I'd probably I'd be an octopus. <laughs> be really fast yeah do many things uh, it's also very intelligent uh, go, you can go around tiny spaces and uh, yeah the, uh, even octopus jumps out of water sometimes <laughs> <laughs> so we, we don't know uh, actually a lot of things that octopus do we still don't know it's it's very very intelligent it camouflages so yeah it probably be that <laughs> told me that three hearts, huh? yeah, yeah 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 some of them well, I, I haven't thought of this question, but if I were to be a sea creature, I think uh, a turtle. Yeah. yeah because I guess, I, I don't know, I might be wrong, but one thing uh, I find fascinating about turtles, they're pretty graceful creatures when they're underwater. Because uh, one experience I got was when I was uh, uh, at the Great Barrier Reef. I got managed to see, I mean, a couple of, I mean, uh, one or two turtles when they were swimming, they were swimming pretty gracefully. So I was like, pretty, uh, so called, like, wow. I mean, who have thought the, the Seahawk turtle was, was able to swim quite gracefully? Yeah. Mm, very interesting question. And maybe you guys might think that I want to be a giant clam. <laughs> 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 but I, I gave a little bit of a thought about it. And mm, if I were to be a marine creature, maybe a coral. Yeah, because I feel like I do a lot of good things as a coral. Um, not not just not just um, sort of filter feeding from the water, but like you know, corals can build homes for other animals as well. So I welcome people to come over in the homes. Yeah. Uh, for me, I'm kind of beluga. You know, the the, one the in indori, the one that can do the echolocation. Oh, right. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he will concentrate, right? You can see everything, right, in the world. 
Yeah, so so that will be me. Uh, and uh, I think let's give all our speakers a wonderful round of applause. Thank you so, so much. Right, and, uh, and I think without further ado, we are going to show you the next uh, tech turret, which will be happening not very long, right? It's going to be happening on 29 July. We secured the speakers. It will be on artificial intelligence, right? So, so, uh, so, so we are very, very blessed. Uh, we have uh, a range of speakers from, and some of them are former Tectaric participants, including my younger brother himself, <laughs> right? The one who started, kickstarted the whole Tectaric. Uh, and we have, uh, from facial recognition, we're talking to about uh, deep learning. We will also be uh, talking on uh, using semantics. And I can't remember what's the other one. The other one is, if I'm not wrong, it's a social. Ah, yep, that one. Yeah, so these are our four speakers, right? So we have Amrullah uh, from Face Record. We have Prof Nadi uh, Nadia, uh, Nadine uh, with her robot Nadine. It's a social robot. That's a robot, uh, that's not a human. Uh. <laughs> Just in case you're wondering. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we have uh, TV from Cookie, who does. Uh, 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 kind of uh, artificial intelligence for business solutions, and then we also have Prof Vijay, uh, who will be sharing about computer vision and deep learning. Right, so I hope to see you for the next tech tarot. And as for as as those who are not first timers over here know that you every tech tarot you graduate as a pathfinder, so you will enjoy certain uh, benefits and perks uh, to future uh, uh, tech tarot. Right, and still stay tuned for tech tarot. If you wanna uh, like us, you like us on Facebook, Grown Up Initiative. You can also start to share with. The rest, and I think the last thing which I really, really want to do is to present a gift uh, to our fellow speakers. So, in the spirit of tetare, right? We always pull. We have aprons. Ah, aprons, right? So these are special tetare aprons, right? So the first one, I'll pass it to Mr. Chin Mi. Thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> okay, so next person would be Mr. Vignesh. Here you go. Thank you so much. And then we have. For Hakim, so here you go, right? And last but not least, so that you won't get dirty when you study your clams, right? <laughs> so yeah, thanks so so much, right? So maybe before we go, let's take a group photo. You wanna take a group photo, right? So maybe we stand together together the speakers, and then we call it a day. You can spend your time here. It's a twenty-four hour park. Uh, up to you. Yeah. Thank you so so much. Let's give them and all of us a round of applause. Thank you.